250 years ago, one individual down to Spain had the audacity to ask the question, who needs a king? Actually, I'm further than that. So I call him the king, the royal root of England. That was quite something for the time in which he lived. Where the kings lived by divine right. This fundamental question which established the principles of individualism, individual sovereignty in America, spelled the end of the hereditary, monarchical, landed property states in Europe. Now, 250 years later, with the enormous growth of different nation states and associated loss of individual property, uh, individual sovereignty and freedom, we must ask the basic fundamental question, who needs the state? Before doing so, and many of you of course know many of the definitions, I'll just put them there for those people who have never seen them, um, you have to ask what is freedom. Everybody wants freedom, yet very few individuals really know what being free really is. Freedom means that an individual has total control of his or her life and all its moral, non-procreated derivatives, which we call property. This property can be divided into two classes, actually primary property, IDs, and secondary property is the physical properties, physical possessions that one has. The opposite of freedom, the loss of control of one's life and property means slavery. If I get emotional about the subject, I was subjected at one time in my life, during World War II as a teenager, to the loss of my control over my life and property, and barely, barely escaped with my life. So it's a very important subject to me. We were occupied in the Netherlands by the Germans, and at the end of the war, we were just about all starving. And it took quite a while to recover from that. Freedom constitutes an all or nothing proposition. Any compromise will undermine its premise and will eventually lead to total loss of freedom. And we refer back to slavery. It was keenly observed by the philosopher Tertullian to 160 to 30 AD. You cannot parcel out freedom in pieces because freedom is an all or nothing proposition. He didn't say propositions, all or nothing. The consequences of not adhering to this absolute concept of freedom has been brilliantly described by the Nobel, Nobel Prize laureate economist and Frederick Hayek in his book, The Road to Serpent. By the way, on Amazon.com, I guess it's the best on the bestseller list or very high on the seller list. This presentation will address the alternative path, The Road to Freedom. Before we go there, we have to ask what it means, what we mean by government, and what we mean by the state. How did these organiza this organization, or those organizations, originate in the first place? Is their function social, or is it antisocial? As far back as one can follow the course of civilization, it presents two different types of political, social organization. The difference is not one of degree, but of kind. It does not do to classify both under the same generic name of government, even though this has been done lately. So we know government is any proprietary organization that can protect life and property by voluntary contractual subscription. According to Thomas Paine, it's in the its origin is in a common understanding and a common agreement of society. 
and the design and the end of government is freedom and security. It implements the common desire of society first for freedom and second for security. Beyond this, it doesn't go. It contemplates no positive intervention upon the individual, but only a negative intervention. In contrast, the political state did not originate the common understanding and agreement of society. It originated in conquest and in confiscation. And as such, the state, I mean, said the political state, can be considered a social organization based upon coercion. It originated by confiscation and it remains in power by coercion. Far from contemplating freedom and security, the social organization is primarily, primarily the continuous economic exploitation of one class by the other. It's really a concept of stratification of society in the ruling class and everybody else. The state is concerned with only so much freedom and security as is consistent with its primary intention. Make sure that the natives don't become restless. The social structure of human organization has not changed markedly from the early tribal chief and witch doctor, which can be now represented by state, the institution of states and church. The structure of these organizations evolved in sophistication with the growth of other sciences. However, its philosophical nature has not. The relative, the relative, the relative strength has changed over the centuries, with the state currently more, do, more dominant, whereas that was not the case during the Dark Ages, where the church was more dominant. Individual freedom and sovereignty have never existed at any time in the history of man. The closest we have come is during the American Revolution, the state of the Declaration of Independence. Unfortunately, this great opportunity for individual sovereignty was lost almost immediately with the Articles of Confederacy creating 13 states and the subsequent compromised constitution written by committee is actually building the concept of interpretation to get around it. The colonialists were very much involved mentally in the concept of the state and never really escaped it. The American dream during the late 18th and 19th century was the result not because of the institution of, of government, but because the inability of the state to grow fast enough to gain control over the fastly expanding territory and a very sparse population, which gave the appearance of a certain amount of freedom which they had. It was witnessed also by the establishment of two major political parties representing the stratification again into interest groups. So the state was fully implemented from the beginning. To quote Albert J. Knock in his wonderful book, Our Enemy the State, the reason for this propensity to the political state can be traced to human nature. There are only two means whereby men's needs and desires can be satisfied. One is by production and exchange of wealth, both goods and services, which the economic means. The other is by the uncompensated misappropriation rather, of appropriation of wealth by others, which is called the political means. Since one of the basic laws of human nature is man always tends to satisfy his needs and desires with the least possible exertion, history has shown that most men will use the expedience of a political means wherever possible. And we witness this, of course, every day by the political donations to the major parties, all the lobbying going on in Washington, D.C., that <coughs> things haven't changed very much. Where are you now? The two major philosophical concepts of social organization, collectivism 
and of individualism. On the collectivism, the concept is that the collective, of course represented by the state, has the ultimate right and the individual has no rights. It's the supremacy of the state, of course, in principle and in action. Individualism is the opposite, supremacy of the individual, the rights of the individual being uh, above everything uh, else and the right to man to exercise the, uh, the control of his life in the pursuit of his rational pursuits and happiness. Current political structure and stratification is a linear spectrum. All represent various forms or varieties of collectivism. From the ultra-left socialism to the ultra-right fascism. This is only a difference in the way it's enforced. In the socialism, you have, of course, the direct seizure by the government of private property. On the fascism, you do that by some sort of parliamentary uh, democratic procedure. The end result is the same. In between, on that same linear scale, we have uh, the extreme, the, the left, the liberal, quote liberal, the central Democrats, followed by the center to conservative Republicans. But essentially, all of these factions represent the same thing. The coercive, antisocial, political democracies, or nation states with limited freedom. There's no mention in the press anywhere regarding individual freedom and the social organization structure of the, of the individual supremacy, or voluntary contractual relationships, proprietary organization, total individual freedom, and free enterprise. The, the apathy of the general population regarding the state is fundamental to its very existence. If you ever been associated with, for example, homeowners associations, you know what I mean. The apathy of people to get involved is enormous until it affects them directly in some sort of a way. And at which time you wake up for a couple of minutes, get into political action, throw a tea party here or there, or whatever. Uh, State comes on the apathy of people who stay in power. As a result, the political parties have egregiously expanded the American state from a small original structure to an enormous bureaucratic system of superimposed jurisdiction and reduplicated functions where a citizen lives on a half a dozen or more different overlapping jurisdictions, states, Federal, state, county, township, municipal, school districts, air quality management districts, and yes, homeowners associations. Nearly all of these have the power to tax the individual directly or indirectly or even both. And as we all know, the only limit to the exercise of that power is what they safely can get, can get, can get away with. The state's population can be divided in two classes, the tax consumers and the tax producers. The United States were reaching, directly and indirectly, a proportion of 50% of tax consumers <coughs> as compared to tax producers, which is a very critical state, by the way. Of course, the tax consumers, being tax consumers, do not pay taxes in reality. They only consume services and goods produced by the producing half. Regardless of what they state on the income tax statement, a tax consumer can only consume taxes that cannot pay taxes. Obviously, this, very, this is a very unstable situation which exists in the world today. This can be seen not only in the United States, but also in Europe and various other countries. The turning point in the US came around 1910 
process, even though the seeds for the rise of the American state were planted early, as I mentioned before, at its inception, it took more than a century for the effects to be fully implemented. The Sherman Antitrust Law, followed by the Clayton Antitrust Law in 1910, established the right, the absolute power of the government to actually indict any individual or organization at its will. The only reason they can't do it because they don't have enough manpower to do it. But under its laws, if you follow that, any person, any organization can be fully indicted at their will. We had the election of one of the most progressive presidents in the United States, Woodrow Wilson, other than Obama. Under his power, under his area of, of presidency, uh, we enacted several amazing and powerful, um, for the state that is, acts. One is the federal tax amendment ratification, which gave the government monopoly power to take part of anyone's paycheck or any corporation entity's state paycheck. It, in, it right, right away entered into the private domain of taxation. It was, of course, a very small amount, not to exceed certain amounts. Of course, we all know what that means. The other one was the Federal Reserve Act. This was the de facto nationalization of the banking system. It did not occur in the last couple of years. It occurred with the enactment of the Federal Reserve Act. This gave the government the monopoly to issue money that means to print money at will. Some other things that happened at that time, the Dewey rigid school indoctrination system was implemented vis-a-vis -vis a more free and open Montessori system. And also very importantly, the Fabian Intercollegiate Socialist Society was established at Harvard. This was a precursor to John Maynard King entering Harvard and spreading the economics that he espoused, uh, the Fabian Socialist Economics, to all the major universities in the United States. Also in the war, was the start of World War I in 1914, the Armenian Genocide in 1915, and the Russian Revolution in 1917. So altogether, the people living in that time obviously could not be very happy, just like we may not be very happy today. It was a very bad period, and I call that the turning point. But actually, can be seen here what happened. For example, when the federal government takes control of the issuance of money, what is shown here is the consumer price index before that that wiggly line is the consumer price index before the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, and what happened to it afterwards. The consumer price index is a matter of inflation, obviously. Printing money, which means printing up the government money and access the goods and services that are being offered. Actually, it's a law paper that means that a straight line with the, the red line there is the best fit to the data. And it turns out that the extreme came out to be an exact. When I did a regression analysis, there was a complete break there in 1913. During colonial times prior to 1913, we actually had the consumer price index decreasing at a half a percent per year. And if that would have continued for the next 97 years until now, our dollar would be worth $1.60 in terms of the 1913 dollars. What actually happened is the inflation at an average rate, compounded rate of 3.27 percent per year. When you take that out for 97 years, the dollar is worth less than four cents on the dollar. So we either had 160 without the Federal Reserve Act, and we have less than four cents after, which is a factor of 40. Inflation constitutes theft by the government, but it's still taxation. So in addition to the procedure of having to go through of raising taxes, it has been stealing money by printing it all along.
Fabian system of economics was pretty much discussed and done away with, we thought, by Henry Hazlitt in his book, The Failure of the New Economics, of John Maynard Keynes' book, to the general theory of employment, interest, and money. This is the de facto economics books in all the major universities that our children are subjected to. He went through this book, paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, and his conclusion was very simple. I have been unable to find in it a single, a single doctrine that is both true and it's original. What is original in the book is not true, and what is true is not original. It doesn't stop the government from continuing the same false premises, even after the book from Rothbard came out discussing the causes and effect of the Great Depression, we've fallen right back into the same mode of operation. And Bernanke and all these people, professors from Princeton and Harvard, all indoctrinated in the same system, are furthering the same fallacies that are prevalent within the book of Mark of John Maynard Keynes. The Austrian School of Economics, unfortunately, had to wait for translation of human action, the human action book by von Mises, that took a while, uh, and it never gained prominence. When Mises came to the United States, he couldn't even find a professorship in a chair. Currently, we have a few schools teaching, the Austrian School, uh, including Chicago, and George Mason University, those they call it, but that's just about almost it, uh, as far as I know. The worldwide spectacle we are witnessing today is the deterioration of society and the unraveling of the nation states. Actually, as I mentioned, this process has been going on for a while, but it's currently accelerating an extreme rapid pace. During the past century, the growth of polit political state bureaucracy, power and expenditures have gone dramatically. Almost, as I mentioned, half of the population is directly or indir indirectly a tax consumer at the expense of the other half of tax producers and taxpayers. As in physics, unstable systems will result in the ultimate failure. In the case of unstable political nations, the government, the failure will become imminent. When exactly it will happen, we don't know, but the cracks are showing in the European Union, as witnessed by the failure of some of the countries, called the pigs, with two eyes, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, all unraveling under the bloated bureaucracies, unbalanced budgets, and national debts. Similarly, in the United States, uh, we see this same process of running up the debts, not only at the federal level, but at the state levels, municipal levels, to levels, and, and, and to levels that cannot be repaid not even counting the unfunded liabilities associated with Social Security, for example. Now, how well are they doing in the purported protection of life and property? I think this slide is a testimony to their absolute dismal failure. During the, eight, during the 20th century, we have had 88 wars resulting in 170 million casualties. Astronomical destruction of property that was produced by producers at one time. In contrast, the 19th century had 17 wars and 36 million casualties. The result of that is not only the state growing, but also the increased sophistication of the weaponry that we have today. Today we are capable of destroying all of mankind with biological, and nuclear warfare. Consequently, we hope this will never happen and we'll be able to establish a proprietary society as soon as the demise of the nation states will occur. What we need for the human species to survive 
or here's a slide by the Lombos. Um, the political actions are very kind of interesting. The greatest fallacy promulgated by all civilizations is that freedom can be obtained through coercion. In order for the human species to survive and achieve their full potential and the pursuit of happiness, the social organization must be based upon an integrated moral and rational code of values and development of a science similar to what we have experienced in the physical sciences. The unified theory in the physical sciences has always been the exchange of mass and energy. As we all know from E is equal mc squared, energy is mass times the speed of light to, to the power of two. Very, it seems like a very simple concept, but to derive at this concept, concept was an extremely difficult process of reasoning, ration, ration, uh, rationalization, and um, investigation. Similarly, in the human sphere, we have to establish basic principle. The principle is one that all human interactions are exchange of property. One, either property of the primary sense, i.e. love, and of the secondary property, which means physical things, trading in the marketplace. And there are only two ways, two exclusive ways, by which this exchange can occur. One is by voluntary contractual exchange. The other is by coercive or forcible exchange, involuntary. The latter can come about by direct force or it can be done by fraud or deception. The social condition is not only the contractual or voluntary conduct and action that social organization enhance an individual's life, presenting a net gain or profit, a win-win situation, as Jay is calling it. And those are both rational and moral. This social condition is not only desirable, but essential to its proper function and survival. The alternative coercive conduct is destructive to life and property, representing a net loss and is irrational, therefore, and immoral. The latter is the cause of all human conflicts, wars, destitution, prevalent in all of mankind's history to date. The natural reg regulator of nature is the concept of profit and loss. And guess, rich class of people keep denouncing the concept of profit and loss. The state, the civil servants, the universities, supported this concept. It's the basic concept underlying all the actions in nature. We, can see, we have seen it in evolution. The concept of mutation is one of profit and loss. It just does not only pertain to the marketplace, it pertains to our evolution. We can see it in the order of nature, flocks of birds, school of fish. There's a feedback mechanism there, a natural order that's prevalent in all of nature. Of course, it's prevalent in the free marketplace when people trade, hopefully, to gain and make a profit rather than a loss. It's true, of course, in mechanical systems like autopilots. The feedback mass mechanism is required there to control all various industrial equipment. It also, as Ayn Rand explained, applies to the concept of morality. That which is pro-life, those actions, on our code of act, ethics, those, those actions that are pro-life that are, pro are moral, those, are, those that are anti-life, therefore representing a loss, are immoral. If one, pursu if one pursues the course of negative action of net loss, just like in business, the person will die. Any, and any living entity that does not act pro-life will not continue to exist. So the concept of profit and life, a profit and loss is an all uh, involved, uh, involving process which is put upon us by natural law. Fortunately today, 
we have an extensive collection of contributions to the various philosophical disciplines of individualism and social organization, which will provide new intellectuals the opportunity for integration of these contributions into an authentic science of freedom. I have a list here, and I won't take the time to go through each of those, but most of you are familiar with those. These are major contributions on which these are giants in the field of proprietary management of law, society, and of course, ethics. I am Rand right now on the concept of ethics, objectivist ethics, uh, major contribution to the field of philosophy. And in terms of Brandon, who will be honored in this meeting, uh, contribution of psychology and psychotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Columbus, with his introduction of the application of science to the volitional uh, conduct of people. There's some new developments that have been made and uh, will be discussed in this meeting. The wind wind theory, volitional sciences by Snelson. New concept of real property, land ownership, the art of community by Spencer, who is standing there. I have a couple of contributions that I made or I'm making. The application of the concept of free sharing or insurance to a win-win government, proprietary structure of governmental services, voluntary, and currently working on a new theory of private money and credit. And associated with that voluntary compliance jurisprudence. Uh, they will be forthcoming in future lectures. I won't have time at this particular junction to go into the exposition of each of those in detail on provided basic sketch. What is important here is that there are new developments going on all the time. And I consider the concept of the issuance of money, individual sovereignty of money, extremely important in addition to the proprietary management of government services by insurance companies. An associated system of voluntary compliance during jurisprudence extremely uh, important with regard to how we administer and uh, provide the security of property in the government. Am I out of time? Twenty more minutes. Twenty more minutes. <laughs> okay, let's go to the first concept. As defined earlier in the presentation, government is any proprietary organization that protects life and property by voluntary contractual subscription. It occurred to me after listening to a presentation by Loai, uh, one of the courses Columbus. I never took a course by Columbus, by the way. My first introduction because I worked with Albert Law, I said, why don't you come by sometime, we have this course going, and I, I agreed to attend, and it was quite, quite an eye-opener for me. So it occurred to me, listening, regarding improving the structure of the government, which he meant at the time, the state, that the marketplace already had an organization that provides contracts for protection of life and property. Mm -hmm by voluntary subscription. These organizations are called insurance companies. Of course, they, they, they themselves do not know that they're in the government business right now, but they do provide protection of life and property. At that time, Columbus was expounding an increase of government of the state. I should say the state. I should get the terms correct in the states that they came. And he was actually advocating a five-branch government. One was a constitutional branch to make sure that the constitution was adhered to, and the other one was a restrictive branch on top of the other, of the other three branches. The restrictive branch was kind of a checks and balances system. And that kind of didn't sit too well, uh, with me at least. So thinking about it, it occurred to me that insurance was the natural way, the alternative to true voluntary or proprietary managed uh, government services. Insurance companies provide low-cost 
contractual life, health, and property insurance, as well as catastrophic insurance, based upon actuarial principle, principles of risk sharing, which really reduces the cost on an individual basis, considering that no one individual knows exactly when they would die. But certainly, we can always predict out of a million people how many people are going to die. And therefore, we can write policies that will reimburse people for life uh, in the case of death uh, occurring. So we have life insurance, we have also actuarial services with regard to property insurance and with regard to uh, catastrophic insurance. Both the purchaser and the provider of the insurance contract, which are called policies, have the same objective. Security and protection of life and property. If the insured dies, becomes ill, or experiences a loss of property, the insurer must contractually pay up according to the terms of the contract. To maximize its profits, the insurer will do whatever is necessary to protect the insurer's life, his health, and his property, which is exactly what the insured person objective is as well. Consequently, both the insured and the insurer have the same objective, which is a typical win-win situation. Insurance underwriting provides a balance between cost and protection. Uh, the, cost of in, the cost of insurance and the cost of protection. Because it will tend to underwrite any organization that will extend the life or maintain the health or protect the property of individuals. And will subcontract with them or get directly involved in the process. As a result of this balance, actuarial underwriting and competition in the free market between various providers, the overall cost of providing protection to life, property, and health will continue to be lowered, while the quality of these government services will increase similar to those in other free market products. Because the potential exposure by any one insurer, insurer of unexpected the two unexpected catastrophic events, the insurance companies co-insure with one another. This co-insurance will provide for any for national defense, the national defense if necessary, but in addition to that, provides the industry with an internal system of checks and balances. Because the co-insurers, you have to have access to one another's books, and therefore it provides an internal check and balances in the case of the insurance companies much more so than the SEC ever could do, witness all the failures of that organization. Similarly, when you apply that to other corporations in the free market, demand for limited liability insurance will pro provide protection to potential investors, while at the same time provide the industry with an external system of checks and balances on their operation. I introduced this concept first at the 1962 Graduate Symposium of, Sympo of Golombo's courses, and was, subsequent, was subsequently incorporated in course 5050 materials, which you can purchase uh, outside for a much more detailed exposition. And Jay has done an excellent job of, of providing great insight into this concept. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to go into the concept of money. Ten minutes. Um, are we right? Okay. The contribution that I make with regard to development of the issue of private sovereignty of money and credit is an extremely important one. It will supplant the current fired counterfeit money issue by the, by the state. And it will be instituted in cyberspace with the concept of virtual money. This theory is based upon an extension of the Austrian school theory of money and credit and especially upon the works of Regal, which were successfully recovered by Spencer uh, some time ago and published on the various books, The Flight of, from Inflation 
and the personal enterprise system. Do I have the titles right? Private enterprise money. Private enterprise money. Unfortunately, the time period, Regal was not able to find a system to implement it. But the current technological development of the industry of the internet, the computer technology, we can now implement fully the concept of money based upon basic fundamental concept definition. And let me mention first that people now can graduate with a PhD in economics and not be able to define what money is. They'll talk about it. They have mathematical models, econometric models dealing with money, but they cannot define what money is. Other than it's a medium of exchange, which we all know. Regal, and I subscribe to this definition, says money is a contractual obligation issued by the buyer. It's issued by the buyer, not by the government. In exchange for value received from a seller, expressed in the agreed upon currency unit, wherever they are, promising to deliver equivalent value of services and products at a future time and which is transferable and acceptable to other sellers. Now think about that for a minute. It's a contractual contract. It promises delivery to the seller when he gives up his product and his services, or equivalent services, by contract. It's done at the currency of his choice, and currency that's acceptable to any other seller in the marketplace, and therefore it's transferable and therefore movable. Inherent in this definition is the exclusion of any non-producer. Because money can only be issued by individuals or organizations that produce goods and services. And those are the issuers of money, not the non-producer like the state. Ultimately, when the money runs its course, and the future of money will not be of currency, of this kind that we know, like bills, coins, or whatever. It will actually be virtual money. It will be done by a system of checks and balances and computers. Uh, and the issuance of the money, as I mentioned, will be by individuals, not by the banks. So any individual in good, good credit standing can issue money and will be able to issue money at the time of purchase. That money will then rotate through the economy until the seller is satisfied in obtaining goods and services that he wants in return for what he gave up. Consequently, money has a beginning and an end. The total amount of money in circulation is determined by the total value of trades and the amount of time uh, trades and the amount of time it takes until redemption. This fundamental system can now be implemented on a world scale basis, competitive basis, and, and it is done today. World currency trading today has reached a level of $4 trillion a day in all different currencies worldwide, <coughs> all done on electronically, in a worldwide, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It never sleeps. People by huge computer banks are doing all this trading. Four trillion dollars a day. It's a huge market, a huge opportunity for private money. Why we, do, do, why we need money, I will discuss here, is amply discussed in the Austrian School of Economics, and of course, a free marketplace could not exist without that, without money. The concept of jurisprudence. Frederick Bastiat said, the law is justice. I'm stating it here as law is the prevention of injustice. Now can it be implemented? It's tied directly to the concept of the issuance of money by people, by individuals, the individual sovereignty of money. The enforcement will be by voluntary compliance, arbitra arbitration, and resolution, therefore, by restitution. Basically, today, if we do, did away with all the coercive laws, unnecessary laws in this country, I think we would empty 95% of the jails. 
most of the criminals in jail represent incurs or a violations of some code, some regulation, some state regulation, arbitrary one. In income tax evasion, drug peddling, movement, whatever. The other five percent is there because of various other reasons. If you go through this concept, the first thing in a free society, we'll see the concept of exe of, of, uh, of uh, uh, exemplary concept. It's a moral concept by example. I call it the Disneyland principle. If you keep the streets clean, people will tend not to throw garbage on the street. If there's a moral society, a contractual society, people will tend to adhere to the basic natural order, voluntary contractual exchange and order. The next one, has to do with the concept of the free market itself. In the propriety of society, we have voluntary exchange, and therefore, instead of coercive exchange. It eliminates friction. It doesn't get people upset. It's a win-win situation. Everybody's happy. Just about everybody. But it will eliminate a lot of friction, resentment, and it certainly will eliminate potentially wars. Then, with the insurance concept of providing protection, the risk-reward ratio of potential violator of property is greatly increased. It's very difficult to, without money, physical money, to hold up a bank. There's nothing to rob. There's only a computer bank there. <coughs> Individuals are not being held up. They don't carry cash. They only have virtual money. Various other things within society the increase, of course, of private protection, as Fred Myers earlier discussed, fire protection, so forth, of course, will uh, provide uh, additional risk for criminals, potential criminals. Criminals are risk averters. See, if you'll know, they go to places where access to other people's property is easiest to accomplish. If you make it difficult, they stay away. Next thing, if there are transgressions with regard to property, uh, there's voluntary dispute resolution. People will be notified, and people typically in a free market will settle that accordingly because it behooves everybody to do so in a free society with free money, proprietary money access, and the ability to either issue or not issue money. If the voluntary resolution cannot be reached, we can go to arbitration, the concept of arbitration. And if arbitration cannot establish, of course, the major objective of justice is restitution. The major intent is the protection of the person that is being violated. So restitution is very important. Anybody that under these circumstances faces one possibility, he no longer is part of the exchange process. His credit is no longer good. Remember, there is no there is no cash around. Where are you going to buy food? What are you going to do if you're excluded? It really becomes a concept of exclusion, which will run most will make most people run to for voluntary compliance for jurisdiction for arbitration, and therefore jurisprudence. The concept will ultimately result in a few people remaining that do not want to face the possibility of access of exile. Now, so there are no jails, but there's only one, one way out, is exile for people, voluntary exile. So consequently, we have this potential concept that will be including. So in summary, let me go through this. I had actually here, and we already went through this, the history of the world in one lesson. I think all anybody needs to know the history of money and the history of civilization is just about written down here other than the establishment of the <coughs> agricultural society, agrarian society. We have seen the, the, initiate, the uh, invention of money in the in, in year 2500 with the fall of the nation city. At that time we had nation cities, states. We had the early death of money followed by a period of misery, poverty, hunger, starvation, all the dark ages where the church institution became dominant. Finally, coming out of the Dark Ages, the Age of Reason, Isaac Newton, 
come to Spain 250 years ago with the American Revolution and hopefully in the near future the establishment of a free proprietary society. The road to freedom is shown here. The elements, the key elements in building the road to freedom are. And as, always, as I always say, every crisis creates an opportunity. And according to the Obama administration, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> continued development, key elements to road to freedom are continued development of a fully authentic, integrated science of freedom, voluntary competitive educational system, and I'm talking about schools. Education is a lifelong process. I'm running every day. Use. Establishment of individual sovereign territories, free ports, proprietary government services provided by insurance or insurance companies, introduction of individual sovereignty of the private money system and the issues thereof, development of proprietary land and real estate management, and I think Spencer will be talking about some of that on Sunday, and of course, the voluntary compliance jurisprudence with proprietary, proprietary administration and restitution. Not a concept of jails. And of course, utilization of advanced energy systems, desalination and transportation. I'm more familiar with those concepts. Of course, that was one of the main, main areas of, of uh, work and consulting at my company. And it does not consist of solar energy or wind energy, or ocean thermal energy, or any of these defunct energies, which are good for small applications, but do not run an industrial society. So in, in closing, I hope that this presentation has clearly shown the ineff inefficacy and moral depravity of the political nation states in the realm of social organization, and in contrast, the superior advantages of a rational, and moral proprietary management of all resources, individual sovereignty, thereby rendering the state obsolete. To answer the question, do we need the state? I'll leave that open for you to answer. Thank you.